while we'll be covering a bunch of things on safety, which is a highly relevant thing, especially in the, uh, this kind of new foundational models universe, uh, because both uh, uh, Feifei and Mira are accomplished technologists, uh, uh, massively beyond the scope of, of safety, both building amazing things and have been part of the historic contributions, I thought we'd start with a uh, kind of a more broad question, which is, what's currently most exciting you? So, Feifei, I will, in AI, right? Feifei, I'll start with you, Mira, I'll go to you, and then we will dive into safety. Well, so many things are exciting me, but I guess I'll just say something that's on my mind right now. We are finishing the review process of a paper that is coming out, which is redefining a North Star for robotics. I, I feel like this moment working in robotic learning feels a bit like back in the days of ImageNet days, where we're really imagining what can be done that would make robotics dream come true. And this particular paper that we are uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, we're, we're, we're in the rebuttal review stage, um, will lay out a benchmark of a thousand robotic tasks that um, are inspired by actual human activities. So it's a scale we've never seen in robotics research anywhere. Can, uh, is, it, is it too much of a, of a presage to say what like one or two of the most interesting of those tasks are? Um, one or two. Actually, all of the thousand tasks comes from uh, American Labor Bureau survey of American time usage and their equivalent of European government agency where we look at what humans do in their daily activity, and we actually did a quite a bit of study on what people want for robots to help. For example, most people do not want robots to open your Christmas gift. <laughs> Apparently, we still want to do that ourselves, but almost everybody wants the robot to clean the toilet. <laughs> so that's ranked really high. Uh, packing kids' lunch is actually packed, uh, ranked fairly high. Oh, interesting. So, so it, the, we're talking about real human activities instead of, you know how in robotics we tend to see toy examples? Yes, exactly. This is going to be a thousand real tasks. Awesome. Yeah. What's most exciting to me these days is seeing how far we can push the paradigm that's driving all AI development in the field, which is you know, this combination of large neural networks with a ton of data and a vast amount of compute. And in the past few years, we've seen this formula drive a ton of progress in AI research. We saw that with GPT-3, and then again with Codex and the first generation of DALI. So uh, from OpenAI's perspective, we're trying to build these general systems that can think of the world in a similar way that humans do. So systems that have kind of a robust concept of the world. Um, so if an AI system sees an avocado or uh, reads the word avocado, the concept that gets triggered is exactly the same. And it's exciting to see that we've got systems that you know, have uh, mm, achieved some sort of linguistic competency and understanding of visual concepts um, and, and we'll continue to push this paradigm ahead. So let's shift to safety, um, because both of your organizations in different ways are uh, kind of some of the most important industry leaders on what uh, we encounter with thinking about AI safety. And so, um, so uh, Mira, why don't we start with you, just so we mix it up a little bit, and not always go <laughs> in this order, but we'll vary. Um, say a little bit about uh, OpenAI's approach, what kind of being this kind of n novel organization organized around a 501c3 and organizations like this, how, what you're trying to do to identify what safety is 
and how to create those norms both in your own action but also catalyzing other industry? As you know, our mission is to build a general system and figure out how to deploy that beneficially to the world. And, you know, there's just one word, but beneficially, but figuring out how to robustly do that is actually an immense challenge. Um, it's hard to predict the future. It is hard to predict all the ways in which these systems might uh, create mm, harmful biases or other risks that we can't even imagine. But at the very least, we can uh, try to get as much understanding as possible, uh, gather as much knowledge as possible, and leave the options open. And that's OpenAI strategy. We are trying to deploy these systems continuously, but in a controlled way. Uh, that means an API. So GPT-3 was first deployed through an API to a small group of users, and then eventually we broaden up access as we understood how to get a good handle on the risks. Um, but I think it's really hard, and that's why that's actually part of the reason why we decided to deploy GPT-3. Because if you are in the research lab, you may think, this is going to be the most prominent risk based on what we see. But when the model comes into contact with the real world, um, that gets tested. And we found out in several, uh, several times that we've deployed that we were wrong. And the most prominent risk was something else. For example, with GBT3, we were convinced that misinformation was going to be the, the most important risk. And it is very important. But in practice, we saw that um, spam was actually a much bigger risk uh, that we had to focus on. And the same thing happened with DALI as well. So I think it's really important for these models to come in contact with real users with the real world and understand where the friction is, where the limitations are, and iteratively build in mitigations. And the mitigations we're building are, not, are probably not future-proof. Um, but it's, it's a place to start, and it gives us enough knowledge of where to go. Um, but at the same time, we need to think about how the complexity increases as the models become more and more capable. So, for example, with language models, now we oversee the output um, of, of the model by a human for sensitive use cases. And that's not something that would scale with more powerful and advanced models. So then we have to come up with techniques to help humans evaluate uh, the output of these models. And OpenAI has been working with other language model developers to coordinate on some of the standard practices uh, to figure out how to deploy language models safely. Fei Fei, same question, but as opposed to OpenAI, Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute, role of universities with industry, governments, plus the work you guys are doing. Yeah, great question, Reed. You know, safety is one of those words like health. Everybody wants it, but it's really hard to define it. Um, so uh, wearing the hat of the director, co-director of Stanford Human Center AI Institute, which we call uh, Stanford High, uh, we think a lot about what we really want for AI, for future AI. And we come to the word human-centeredness. Um, we focus on infusing the human-centeredness into every stage of AI research, development, education, policy work. Uh, obviously, we're universities, so we don't deploy products, but we hope that what we would inspire as applications will have an impact in productization downstream. So, so AI is not one thing. AI, you know, designing an AI system is, is, is really stages of uh, work decisions. And we believe that every stage of this AI development, uh, we need to infuse the ethics and human-centered values into this. Simplest way to put it, how do we define a problem? For example, do you, is your goal to you know, um, replace humans without consideration 
of all the social implications or augment human capability. That is, before you write a single line of code, you already are thinking about human values. The data, where does it come from? How do you uh, collect it? How do you ensure data integrity? How do you annotate it? There is a whole bunch of, you know, from fairness to privacy to, to just a whole bunch of issues and, and, and considerations. Then the algorithm itself, you know, how, how, is it safe, is it secure, does it, uh, you know, is it biased? And then the decision making using the algorithm, the inference, the, 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 the human, how does it assist the humans or, or, or um, you know, in other for, inform the humans. So every stage of AI development is, uh, needs human consideration and Stanford High is really trying to um, embody that process. And in this, uh, and as, it's not even a side product, a central product of that process is the people we educate, the students, the undergrads, the graduate students, when they come out of this, uh, you know, years of working or s learning uh, from Stanford High's courses and uh, uh, lab work, they become technologists or uh, business leaders or policy thinkers who understand the human centeredness of AI. Yeah. So let's now dive a little deeper in each uh, specific organization. So for Dolly and GPT-3, the front end of the API is in part to kind of understand what the, the possible risk flows look like so that you can begin to train those. How do you take that information and iterate to a beyond human, you know, kind of safety model? How do you take that and also help, you know, kind of lead the way in kind of thinking about this safety within the industry? So for, for GPT-3, for example, um, initially we opened up access to um, use cases that we felt we had the right mitigations in place. So that means very, very, uh, almost like on the first few days, uh, the, the allowed use cases were around search as well as classification but we were not quite comfortable with open-ended generation. And so we worked with um, industry experts from different domains as well as other researchers to red team the model a bit further. We worked with um, other trusted users as well to understand uh, possible ways in which the model would fail, the expectations of the user. And there are many. Um, so from there, we try to, to build in mitigations, both from the model perspective, but also the tools that come after deployment. Um, from the model perspective, one of the central things with GPT-3, but also other generative language models, is the fact that um, the model will make up stuff, and it will not admit when it doesn't have expertise in a specific topic or when it doesn't know the answer. So obviously, that's a problem. And uh, in, in other ways, it could, it could also um, uh, mislead you with the answer. And so we wanted to figure out how do we make the model more robust, more reliable. And we used the feedback that we got from our users on the API. And we used reinforcement learning with human feedback to make uh, the Instruct GPT models, which is a series of models that are far more reliable and do the thing that the operator actually wants them to do. So not only they're more helpful and safe, but they're actually useful. And so there are default models in the API today and um, our users prefer them um, rather than the base model. So this is one way where we use deployment to actually make the models safer, more reliable, and more effective as well. And it is very interesting because it's the first time that safety moves from the theoretical domain into the practical domain, and it merges with capabilities. And by doing that, it kind of forces a standard in the industry, because not only it's safe, but it's actually more effective and more useful. And then 
uh, similarly, one of the things where, um, you know, High, Stanford High um, has pioneered some things, and specifically I'm gest gesturing at the ethics review board, but go anywhere you like with a question. Yeah, just to follow up, right, um, but it's actually been a very encouraging trend to see that companies um, are really thinking about the ethics and the, 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 the uh, safe ways of um, developing and releasing products. In the meantime, in academia, we are also thinking, for example, um, a typical way of, of putting some guardrails in our research uh, in our research activity is um, traditionally, if the research involves human subjects, we have IRB review boards. This has been critical across academia in US universities and also international um, uh, universities that a lot of medical research and human subject related research gets reviewed by a board of expert uh, um, um, faculty and, and so on. But when AI was is starting to, you know, um, become a really big chunk of university research, we don't have an equivalent of an IRB. You know, at the beginning it was okay, it's theoretical, it's just, you know, but very quickly we realized, wait a minute, um, you know, there's so many examples of AI research, we can, for example, face recognition. You know, we, we see um, globally the biases and the harms of bias. So how do we, um, how do we put guardrails in the design of AI research and to ensure even the most technical researchers and students have in mind um, the ethics and the social impacts of their work? So at HAI, uh, one of our functions is to facilitate multidisciplinary research. And uh, Reid, you have been a, um, a board member of our um, institute, so we talk a lot about that. It's really important. We encourage researchers to do interdisciplinary research. But we need a new way, a new IRB, to guide our researchers to think about ethical and social implications. So HAI um, um, was as far as we know, the first organization, university organization in the country that formed uh, what we call an Ethics and Society Review Board, ESR, that reviews all grant applications. And as we assign grants to our researchers, we ensure that the grants work with the ESR board to, um, to articulate the understanding and, and potentially mitigation um, solutions um, of the social and ethical issues of the research. So that's one example of how much we um, put that emphasis in. Another example is our work with the uh, policymakers. We work directly with regulators, policymakers, and frankly, just civil society. Um, um, you know, different um, people, uh, multi-stakeholders, to hear and to communicate the implications of AI, to hear their thoughts, to, uh, to facilitate dialogues. We particularly focus on bringing industry and uh, civil uh, rights organizations, uh, federal and state and local governments and policymakers to the same table create a forum, a safe, neutral forum, to have these conversations, because we all care about innovation and guardrails, and we need this dialogue. And add a little bit about the National Research Cloud, too, because it's part of enabling universities uh, and other entities like this in order to be able to fully participate. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, we recognize is the magic, one of the magic sauce of America in the past century is our ability as a country, uh, as a people, to innovate. We have an incredible ecosystem thanks to our entrepreneurial world, our, um, our um, 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 higher education, um, the, the labs, the researchers, 
also the federal, the role federal government has played in incentivizing research, whether it's NASA or DARPA or NSF and all that. But as AI took off in the past decade, what we observe uh, uh, is that the resources are quickly uh, concentrated in a few companies with compute and data and talent, the three critical resources for doing incredible AI innovation, and which is great. You know, we see incredible things coming out of OpenAI, Microsoft, coming out of Google, DeepMind, coming out of Facebook. Uh, but that's not enough to lift the entire nation to educate more AI talents to you know, stand up um, in the face of uh, global competition. We need to ensure this ecosystem remains healthy so that it's not just concentrated in, in, in industry per se. And right now, under Biden and the administration, the White House and the, the, the Congress have mandated um, a task force study group, a 12-person task force, to figure out what this national research cloud would look like. Um, I'm actually one of the members of this task force, along with other um, people from industry, uh, academia, and government. And hopefully, uh, very soon, we'll come up with our report and uh, push this bill forward to establish this national uh, resource. So, Mira, I'm going to ask you, um, I have obviously a thousand questions for both of you, and depending on what the questions are from the audience, I may ask some more. But I'm going to ask you the last question before I turn to the audience, which is one of the things that GPT-3 and Dolly have both done is shown a path for really amplifying human creativity. It isn't just the downsides that is part of the question around safety and so forth, but also the, in a sense, helping us be more human, be more creative. Say a little bit about the, the kind of the lessons, you know, from Dolly and GPT-3 and what their potential is for this human amplification. Yeah, exactly. So from um, GPT-3, early on, we were surprised to see the ability of the model to generate creative and even touching poetry. Um, so one of the prompts that we uh, gave GPT-3 was to generate a poem in the style of uh, Pablo Neruda that talked about uh, Maxwell's equations. And we were quite surprised that it had this ability to pick up on the elements of uh, Maxwell's foundational electromagnetic equations, but also do that in the style of the love poems of Pablo Neruda. Uh, so that was really beautiful. And a lot of people were uh, playing with poetry and uh, the creative side of, of GPT-3. And I think we saw that even more with DALI. Um, uh, DALI, maybe because it's images and also the form factor in which we made it available through DALI Labs, um, everyone was just having so much fun with it. Even at OpenAI, we would spend hours just generating DALI images. And this really just shows how technologies like DALI can democratize high quality creation um, of images and ideas and can push them so much further. Um, and often, you know, we, we get asked, well, does this in some way um, dilute the, the human creation, the original human creation, and what, what happens in the future? Um, there is this almost instinctive human reaction to protect our own original creations. And I think that it's, if we look back in history, it's actually not so different from, um, you know, what happened in 16th and 17th century where, uh, you know, there weren't that many people that could afford paintings, and so things were quite binary. You were either Rembrandt or nothing, and uh, there wasn't so much of a nuanced appreciation. It was either a great painting or not. And so I think as, as we get tools like DALI or GPT-3, 
maybe there's going to be a more nuanced appreciation for this co-creation and a different appreciation for the original human, human creations. Um, for example, today, you know, you can have a skilled artist that went to art school that can um, try to, to create a replica of the night watch, and to my undiscerning eye, it will look great, uh, but we still value a real Rembrandt differently. So, but you know, you can say, okay, this is sort of an elitist point of view. What, what about the the broader impact? Um, and I think that's actually not so different from the effect of globalization, um, because it's really an exchange of ideas, a cultural exchange, and. Of course, there are sort of unwanted and undesired effects of globalization, but overall, it does create more diversity um, and it does create more prosperity. Um, and we've seen this in history with Western Europe, the 19th century being one of the most fertile and diverse from liberalization of, of uh, cultural exchange. And by contrast, the, after the, the collapse of Roman Empire, it was quite the opposite. Um, and, and so uh, there, there is actually an interesting book about this um, called uh, Creative Destruction that talks about uh, this perceived fear that human talent will be diluted in a way. Um, but actually, if you look at it long term and the global effect, uh, the global effect is one of diversification, one where we end up with more ideas in total, more prosperity, and we will continue to um, develop more information and create artistically, scientifically, and also in a social context. And I think we have time for one question from the audience. Um, I did also ask that last one because if you haven't had a chance to play with Dolly and do your own printout, it's one of the things that OpenAI has helped provision <laughs> us with. So it's a fun uh, experiment. Um, you know, just to the last point that you alluded to, um, you know, first it's very heartening, the thoughtfulness and thoroughness of you know, preempting and mitigating potential impact of launching some of these technologies. And I'm wondering, some of the effects cannot be simulated until you put that out there in the real world and probably at scale. So how do you think about you know, the, 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 the risks and issues at large scale societal effects and potential second order effects as well? Uh, and what do you think you know, is the role that, that we as technology companies can play in that? And, and probably related to that is, you know, um, Fefe, you mentioned governing boards um, as an oversight. And I'm wondering how do you address the tension between the, the, the process interruption and the pace of innovation? We were colleagues in Cloud AI, if you remember, we've had oversight boards internally and you know, things get slightly slowed down as a result of... Um, so would love to hear your thoughts, how, how you think about this. I'm oh, sorry, actually, Mira, why don't you start? You're right. So we're, with deployment, we're just scratching the surface and we're uh, putting these models out there, seeing what people are doing with them, seeing the risks and building tools uh, to mitigate them, but more importantly, bringing the feedback back to the model development stage to build models that are more robust. And I think the alignment technique is really core to that. Um, but more broadly, uh, it's very important that we collectively are thinking about the governance systems of AI because obviously um, the, the developers of these models need to be a diverse group of people, but even that is not enough. And we have to think about AI is sort of like electricity, and so we have to think about the deployment and the governance of these systems more broadly in a, in a global setting and bring in input from all all different fields. Yeah, and also a great question about innovation versus uh, regulation or, or guardrails. I think we all get that question and it's always wonderful to think about it. First of all, I, I don't believe they're mutually exclusive. They're at odds with each other. I do believe as everything else in life, we have to strike the right balance if we 
go to the extreme route that there should be zero you know, guardrails, innovation might come out to fail us all. So it's not necessarily a world we want to live in. And of course, the other side of the extreme is also not good. In the case of uh, AI, I think it's, it's time for every organization from individual um, researchers all the way to the government to have that dialogue, to think about how this can be done. And if it's done right, actually good guardrails can encourage good innovation. I'll give you one example of um, smart camera machine learning work in healthcare environment, which is part of my lab's work, where we actually talk about safety. We actually use cameras to help doctors to monitor safety of patients. Now, the, the, the intention is all great, but immediately we get into privacy issues. We get into bossware issues. You know, who are you watching? What are you watching? This comes back to us as an important social human feedback to push us to innovate more. My team of students who are used to just doing deep learning algorithm are now using a differential privacy algorithm to push for, um, you know, uh, privacy protected machine learning. And then suddenly they realize differential privacy algorithms are too slow. It's never used in videos where we're using cameras. Suddenly that um, guardrail push, the regulatory push, is actually incentivized innovation. We're publishing papers that's pushing differential privacy machine ML algorithms to deal with the large scale data. So this is a perfect example of when we care about these guardrails, they come back to motivate us to innovate better technology. And I think there's plenty of examples in AI that we can do that, and that everybody's better off if we do that. And with that, uh, you can see why both Mira and Feifei are people that I also constantly learn from. Um, and so let's give them a hand.